Before we start the video, I would just like to thank today's sponsor, the Amino app. This is a free mobile app that connects people from around the world based on their interests. So naturally I joined their reptile groups and the first thing I was impressed with was how welcoming the community was. If you have questions about your reptiles, you can post about them or even post a poll to get other people's opinions on what they would recommend. The Amino app also has forums and chat groups about specific types of reptiles that you can participate in. My favorite part, however, about the Amino app would be their quizzes. You can quiz yourself to see if you can identify snakes as quickly as possible and then rate your scores against others. I almost hit coral snake there. Uh, it's a really fun way to test your knowledge and learn more about reptiles and amphibians in a fun and engaging way. Hey everyone, in part one of our genetics video, we discussed recessive, dominant, and codominant genes and how they work with reptiles. And today for part two, I'll be discussing more advanced genetic traits with reptiles, including linebred traits, sex-linked traits, and what pH means in terms of reptile genetics. Before continuing, make sure you watch part one of my genetics video because that's kind of the prerequisite for today's video. If you watch today's without watching part one, it's going to be a little confusing. If you're still here, I'm going to assume that you have watched part one and we'll continue. First, I want to clarify something that I should have clarified in part one. When I use my fingers to represent the alleles, the fingers, I guess, are really representing chromosomes because the allele is a patch of genetic material found on the chromosome. So when I say allele, I'm actually referring to that small genetic patch along one of the chromosomes, not the actual chromosomes themselves. Let's start with line bread traits. Uh, these are traits that show a physical characteristic in the snake that somebody wants to replicate with its offspring, but the trait itself cannot be predicted. It shows up randomly in the babies or in the offspring, and it doesn't act like a dominant, recessive, or a codominant morph. As a result, you can't really breed specifically for it and know exactly what you're going to get in the babies. You just have to breed the snake and hope for the best. You can, however, increase your chance of getting babies with that genetic trait by breeding a parent back to a sibling or another parent or someone in that same family line, hoping that somewhere in that snake's family tree, another one of its family members also carries that genetic trait. As a result, line breeding is really just another form of saying inbreeding. Inbreeding, although it's not recommended, has been shown with reptiles not to produce as many side effects as it does with mammals, birds, and other animals. Inbreeding or line breeding is generally accepted for the first couple of generations with snakes because it doesn't often show side effects like it does with those other animals. If you think about it, with purebred dogs, line breeding happens all the time just to get those specific characteristics that the breeders want in their show quality dogs. As you may have already determined, line breeding gets its name from breeding snakes along the same family line. One example of a line bred trait with snakes is the twin spot hognose snake. In twin spots, the dorsal spot is replaced by two smaller spots along the back of the snake, and it makes the snake look like it has more spots. It's kind of a desired trait with some snakes, but again, it's something you can't predict exactly when you breed a twin spot to another twin spot or even to another family member. Doing so just increases your chances of getting more twin spots. So with our twin spot hognose, we have a twin spot albino hognose snake, we could breed her with a sibling to increase those chances of getting more twin spots, but we don't have access to a sibling of hers that is also a twin spot or really a sibling of hers at all. So we are going to be doing what's called selective breeding and we will be selectively breeding her with another twin spot of a different family line. Selective breeding is not necessarily line breeding because selective breeding is just when you choose which snakes are going to breed with each other. They don't have that natural choice of their own like they would in the wild. So all of captive breeding efforts are pretty much selective breeding. Next, let's talk about sex-linked traits. These are genetic mutations that are not found on just any chromosome, they're found on the sex chromosome itself. So if they're found on the X chromosome in humans, that would be an X-linked trait. If they're found on the Y chromosome, then it would be a Y-linked mutation or Y-linked trait. Similarly, in reptiles, which have sex chromosomes Z and W instead of X and Y, if it's found on the Z, it's a Z-linked trait. If on the W, it's a W-linked trait. 
There have not been any proven sex-linked traits in reptiles, however, but because of the amount of breeding and captivity that's going on, it's inevitable that eventually there will probably be a sex-linked trait proven in the future. So today we're going to use a commonly seen sex-linked trait in humans, the color blindness genetic mutation. This is a recessive X-linked trait because it's found on the X chromosome and the individual needs to have all of their X chromosomes with that mutation in order to express it. Because of this, males with the sex chromosomes of X and Y only need one copy of this mutation, whereas females need both of their X chromosomes to be mutated. To represent a mutated uh, sex chromosome, uh, I'm not going to be using my fingers in the next example like I did in genetics part one. Instead, just kind of follow what the letters say on the screen. We're going to use a little C next to the X chromosome if that chromosome, hypothetically, has the genetic mutation of colorblindness. Uh, to better understand how this works, let's say a man who is colorblind, so his X chromosome has that genetic mutation, has a kid with a woman who is completely normal. She does not carry the colorblind gene at all. Their offspring, there's a couple different options of what their offspring could be. The woman is going to contribute her X chromosome, and it doesn't matter which one she contributes to the child. It's a 50-50 chance regardless, but it doesn't matter because they're both normal X chromosomes. However, the father could contribute either his Y chromosome, which is completely normal, which would result in a male offspring who is not colorblind at all, or he could contribute his mutated X chromosome to the offspring, which would result in a female that carries the colorblind gene, but since it's a recessive trait, she will not be colorblind herself. Now let's say that offspring, which sounds funny because referring to people, but it's a reptile channel, so that's what we say in the reptile world. Let's say she grows up and she breeds with a normal male that does not carry the colorblind gene. He is going to either contribute his uh, normal X chromosome to the young or his Y chromosome to the young. They're both normal, they're just going to determine the sex, basically. And the female is going to contribute either her normal X chromosome to the young, which could result in a normal male or a no normal female. Either way, both of those sex chromosomes will be normal and non-mutated, so whether it's a male or female determined by the dad, the young will not be colorblind. Or that female could contribute her X chromosome with the colorblind mutation to the offspring. Now with the offspring having one uh, X chromosome that is mutated for colorblindness, uh, the dad could either contribute his X chromosome to the young, which is normal, so the baby would again just be a female that carries the colorblind gene, or he could contribute that Y chromosome to the young, which would result in a male that is colorblind because it's a recessive trait and all of that offspring's X chromosomes are mutated. This is why we see colorblindness more often in males than females, because males only need one of their sex chromosomes to be mutated, whereas females need both of their sex chromosomes to be mutated in order to be colorblind. Therefore, in order to get a colorblind female, the dad has to be colorblind and the mom has to either be a carrier of the colorblind mutation or she has to be colorblind too. Uh, again, in reptiles, there have been no proven sex-linked traits. I actually made this video yesterday and uploaded it uh, using the banana morph as a sex-linked trait because I did some research and what I read said that that was a sex-linked trait, but it was old information. And so I want to thank the viewers and the commenters for making me aware that the banana mutation is not a good example of a sex-linked trait, which is why we re-filmed this section of the video because I don't want to send anyone down the wrong hole when it comes to learning snake genetics, uh, but I still wanted to teach you guys how sex-linked traits work. After doing more research, we determined that, yes, the banana morph is, in fact, a codominant trait. The reason why reptile breeders call the banana mutation a sex-linked trait is because if you have a male banana ball python and it was hatched with its mother being a banana, then that male will be more likely to throw female banana offspring with the normals being mostly males. Those ball pythons that throw mostly female bananas are typically called female makers. Whereas if you have a male banana morph ball python with its dad being a banana morph, then that will be considered a male maker because most of its banana offspring will be males and most of the normal offspring from that male banana will be females. Although we do have a friend who bought a couple of male maker banana ball pythons and they threw mostly females. So there's still a lot of questions in the air how exactly this morph works. Uh, hopefully in the future, and I'm sure in the future, we will understand and pinpoint exactly how the banana morph works so that we can predict how it's going to work in the future with their offspring.
By the way, the banana morph in ball pythons is also referred to as the coral glow morph. There's some controversy on whether or not it's the same thing. Basically, two breeders imported uh, ball pythons from the wild that had this genetic mutation. One breeder called it the banana morph, and the other breeder called it the coral glow, coral glow morph. Um, it was within a couple of years of each other, so they kind of came to the market at the same time when those snakes were old enough to breed, and then those babies were up for sale. The breeders have done a lot of research on both of these morphs, and they both act very similarly. They both kind of create the male makers versus female makers. They just act very similar. So a lot of people will say that they are in fact the same thing, but a lot of people are on the other side of the fence and they say they are separate morphs. Only time will tell maybe when we can do some more DNA sequencing studies or some more breeding studies with these two morphs before we can determine once and for all if they are the same thing or if they are separate. General consensus right now is that they are the same thing, they just go by two different names. Finally, let's end today's video about genetics by talking about what pH means in terms of snake genetics. The pH stands for possibly het, and it's the percentage that that snake is het for a specific trait. This really only applies to recessive traits because if a snake is het for a dominant or a codominant gene, it's going to express that visually. However, snakes can hide a recessive trait without showing any physical difference. To understand how possible hets work and how you can get an exact percentage to the chance that that snake is het for a specific recessive gene, let's hypothetically breed a normal hognose snake to a het albino hognose snake. The sexes doesn't matter because this is not a sex-linked trait. This parent could either contribute this allele or this allele uh, they're both normal, so it doesn't really matter, but this is the parent that determines if the baby is going to be het for albino or not. This parent could contribute uh, this normal allele to the baby, and it would be a completely normal mutation, normal baby. Or it could contribute the albino mutated allele to the baby, which would result in a het albino baby snake. Since this is a 50-50 chance, the baby has a 50-50 chance of being het for albino or not. So that's where we get the 50% possibly het albino snakes. Now to see how closely you've been listening, I have a quiz for you. Let's say we breed a het albino hognose snake to another het albino hognose snake. They both look normal, but they carry the albino gene. We know, based on what we learned earlier, that a quarter of those babies will be albino. That means that three quarters of the babies will look normal, but some of them will still be het. So my question for you is if you were a breeder of those two snakes, what would you label the normal looking babies as, including their possible hets? Let me know in the comments below. Pause the video if you have to, um, in order to do your math and maybe do a Punnett square if you need to, and I will tell you the answer at the end of the credits of this video. While you're working on that, I hope you enjoyed today's video of line bred traits, sex linked traits, and how possible hets worked. Thanks for watching and learning with me, and we'll see you next time. Now it's time for the answer to the quiz. Since a quarter of the babies are out of the question since they would be albinos, that leaves us with three quarters of the babies that look normal. Two options for these babies would be het albino, and one option would be completely normal snakes. So that gives us a 66% chance of the babies being het albino, and a 33% chance of those remaining babies being completely normal. In other words, you have a 66% chance of reaching into a bin of the normal looking babies of this clutch and pulling out a head albino baby, and a 33% chance of reaching into that bin and pulling out a completely normal baby. Now that that's all said and done, Ed and I got on the discussion of Harry Potter and the chances of carrying the magical gene and what that would be. Uh, we were pretty sure it's a line bred trait because someone, what was it, someone can be born a witch or a wizard with muggle parents, right? Yep. So neither parent has to have a trait in order to, for a baby to have it, mm -hmm. to be magical. But, but you have a better likelihood of taking two magical parents and breeding them together. You do. Like the Malfoys, which were line bred or inbred to the point where they had pure magical lines mm -hmm. in their family. So Malfoys are a line bred trait. No, they would be, they'd just be. They'd be line bred. Wizards are going to naturally find each other, but some wizards go with non-wizarding parents. Mm-hmm, that's true. And mate with them. So you can have a wizard and a non-witch non still have a baby that's muggle. a muggle, 
or a non magic, uh, either non magical or magical, or they could have all magical. You just can't predict it, really. You just have a better chance, maybe. Yeah, because unless I don't know if that's been proven in the wizarding world. Well, even two wizards breeding can have a non magical baby. Yeah, that, a squib. Yep, squib. Mm hmm. They can be produced by wizarding so, or magical it's, parents. There's no dominant or recessive traits. It's it's a line bred trait. It's all a line bred. Mm hmm.